Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Ways After Dark. I said it last <laughs> night, and it's probably going to be um, this way until the end of session. Meetings are running into each other, so we can't get to ours until others are finished, so we apologize for being late. Committee Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Brown Nay. Here. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Here. Assemblywoman Howdigee. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblyman Miller. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblywoman Peters. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Assemblyman Yeager. And Chair Monroe Marino. Thank you so much. Will you please mark Assemblyman Miller and Assemblywoman Bacchus absent excuse and Assemblyman Yeager present when he arrives. We have a few bills on our agenda tonight and we are going to start um, our bills kind of out of order. If you are joining us um, by phone, you'd like to dial in for public comment, which will be at the end of tonight's meeting. That number is 888-475-4499. And our meeting ID is 860-999-03430. And I'll remind everyone to please um, mute or turn their electronic devices on vibrate so they won't be disruptive. If you come up to speak in public comment at the end of the meeting, there's only two minutes per speaker for public comment. And with that, we have a long night ahead of us, so we'll get right into it. And as I said, we're gonna start our bills out of order. We're gonna start with Assembly Bill 67. Remember that short presentations are great. Good evening, Chair Monroe Moreno and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Cisco Aguilar, Secretary of State. It is a pleasure here to be here today. I am joined by Deputy Secretary for Securities, Aaron Houston in Las Vegas. We're here today to give you a brief overview, brief, of the Securities Division of the Secretary of State's Office and our proposal to create a fund for victim securities fraud. Aaron? Good, uh, good afternoon, Aaron Houston, for the record. Um, AB 67 proposes to establish a victim's restitution fund for victims of securities fraud. Nevada Constitution provides for restitution to, for victims of a crime. However, many guilty parties in securities cases have no money with which to make their victims whole. AB 67 aims to fill that gap. AB 67 creates a fund out of monies received as penalties from administrative orders arising from violations of NRS 90 and from securities division revenue. Nevada residents who are victims of securities fraud and for whom an award of restitution has been made in a criminal adjudication can then apply for a small amount of recompense from the restitution fund. Most victims of securities fraud receive very little or no money back from their original investment. AB 67 proposes to divert a fractional amount of revenue that presently goes to the general fund to a separate fund for victims of securities fraud. In the past, the securities division has received close to 200,000 per year through enforcement action and receives um, far more than that in revenue from registration and licensing fees. Only victims who have been awarded restitution as set forth in NRS 90 could apply for relief from the fund. And under AB 67, applicants who have been awarded restitution through criminal conviction can apply for repayment through monies collected in this fund up to a maximum of $25,000. Of note, note, up until a few years ago, the revenue in consideration today was maintained within the securities division to be used by and support of the securities division. We have also requested a few friendly amendments to the bill. The biggest change creates a floor to the balance of the fund in the amount of $250,000. We're requesting that this be funded with securities division revenue. We have also have an amendment that allows for donations to the fund, um, which was requested by a member of the Assembly Committee for the Judiciary. And uh, the last amendment makes clear and easier for victims to apply for assistance from the fund, which was requested from um, other community stakeholders. Chair Monroe Moreno, thank you so much for inviting us to present AB 67 to the committee today. That concludes our presentation, and we hope the committee will support the measure. I am happy to answer any questions the committee members may have. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was just about to ask you to turn your mic off in Las Vegas. Um, could you just walk us through the amendment again? Because I don't believe members, I'm not sure if they have a copy of it or not. Do you all have a copy of the amendment? Okay, great. 
I, I do have one question for you. Could you indicate the, the impact that would be on the general fund as a result of this revenue source no longer being deposited into the unrestricted general fund? Um, yes, uh, Chairman Ren Marin Monroe Moreno. Sorry, it's been a really long day. I um, thank you for the question. Yes, the, <laughs> the impact would be 250000 as a maximum. Um, out of approximately $35 million of revenue that is um, received by the Securities Division every year. Members, any other questions for either one of the presenters? Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you so much. Um, Greetings this evening. Um, this is such a rampant issue um, in many industries and securities fraud and we have it in real estate and just so many areas. I was just curious as far as, um, you know, setting up this uh, fund for victims. Do you know or have you compared our banking institutions or other financial institutions? Have they established anything like this to assist with that. I'm just curious, you know, I know we're doing it as a state, but what are the the trends for that? I know in real estate we have a few um, funds for victims of, you know, contractors in different areas. So just curious if there's a trend in other areas in the financial world to assist with any of this. Chair Monroe Moreno, through you, this is actually based on a NASA model rule that uh, has been promulgated in six other states and it, there is an attempt to, to get this rule um, passed in, in as many states as possible for the exact reasons that you mentioned. Um, I don't know the answer to the banking institutions outside of the securities division realm, but I'm happy to get that information and provide it at a later time. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a question. <clears throat> you said it um, has been implemented in six other states. With the f the amount of the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, how? What's your anticipated <clears throat> use of this fund? The amount of payouts do you anticipate on an annual basis, and is two hundred and fifty thousand enough? Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman Roman Moreno. We. We would anticipate three or four, maybe more applicants every year. We, we do have a high amount of securities fraud investigations and then resulting convictions. Um, I would estimate that $250,000 is a very good starting place. I can tell you that other states have a higher um, threshold. Um, the one state, I believe it's North Dakota, but I could be wrong about the state. They just passed this as a statute, um, and it was for $1 million in that state. Thank Madam you. Chair, to answer your question, Cisco Aguilar, Secretary of State, what has happened since we introduced this legislation, our calls and our volume has increased with individuals coming forward because they now see an opportunity to recoup what they've lost. The embarrassment factor is being outweighed by the ability to receive some type of compensation. Thank you for that information. So with those calls that you have coming in, do you have kind of a guesstimate of how much those losses have been? Have you been able to add those up to? Thank you for the question, Chairman Roe Moreno. I would say on average it's anywhere from 50000 per victim, anywhere up to 200000 300000 on on average. We have victims who have lost millions. We have victims who have lost $5,000. Um, even for the victim who's lost $5,000, though, that might represent a major part of their earnings and their savings and something that is very difficult for them to recover from. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was just curious how a victim might find out about this process, and you mentioned making the application easier, I believe. So what does that process look like? Thank you. Madam Chair Monroe Chair. Moreno, through you. Oh, you can oh, sorry, go directly go ahead, to Secretary. the member. That's okay. You can go directly to the member. Go directly to the member. Go ahead, Secretary. <laughs> Assemblywoman Gorlo. Um, 
the amount of earned media that took place on the original introduction of the bill has pretty a pretty significant. We're also working with community partners such as ARP to let their members know about this opportunity. Again, it's going to be a communication process, but given the the number of calls that have increased to the department to make these, it's also to you're also seeing issues come forward from men who generally don't because of the crypto industry too. May I have a quick follow up? Thank you. Um, so with the reimbursement for the fraud victims, is it a percentage of what they've lost or how do you determine who gets what amount? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Gorlo. The, the way the bill is drafted, there's a cap at $25,000. Um, that that amount, it, it's, it's up to $25,000. So if the person only lost $10,000, they can put in a a request for $10,000, but the cap is $25,000. And the purpose for that is just to maintain a balance in the fund. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Seeing none, I thank you so much for the presentation and we will move to testimony and support. <clears throat> If you're here in Carson City and you'd like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 67, I invite you to the table. And I see no one coming forward, but we do have one person in Las Vegas, so we'll go to Las Vegas. Make sure you turn on your mic, state and spell your name for the record, please. Good evening, Chair Monroe Moreno. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Maria Moore, M-A-R-I-A-M-O-O-R-E, representing ARP Nevada. And on behalf of all victims of securities fraud, ARP, Nevada is pleased to testify in support of AB 67. There are a few viable options for recovering money losses, to security scams. AB support, ARP supports AB 67 because it adds an important missing tool to help victims of securities fraud. Under current law, investors who lose money because of violations of our securities laws can obtain compensation for their loss from either restitution ordered in an enforcement action by the securities commissioner or from a private lawsuit against a violator. But there's no hope for recovering lost money when the securities commissioner cannot collect the restitution from the defendant or the victim cannot collect the private suit judgment from the defendant. The compensation fund would help solve this problem by creating a way of to partially compensate the investment fraud victims when the perpetrator is insolvent. The securities commissioner would put the money in the compensation fund from the civil penalties and other payments to the state from enforcement actions against larger companies. Then when an insolvent scammer defrauds investors, the victims of that scam could apply for compensation to recover at, at least a portion of their loss. We know that the compensation fund will work because the same concept has been working with the Consumer Fraud Protection Bureau, Civil Penalty Fund. This CFPB fund has been successfully operating for more than 10 years through both Republican and Democratic administration. The fund has paid more than $671 million to consumers who would otherwise not receive compensation. And as the, you heard from the Secretary of State, he said victims are often reluctant to report financial crimes, and this would be a way of um, getting some restitution, and they might be more willing to talk. A solution that builds opportunity for victim restitution like the state level funded creation in AB 67 should be on the table. We urge your support for this essential piece of legislation and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 67? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. And we will move to opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 67? Seeing none, is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 67? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone that would like to testify in opposition or neutral on Assembly Bill 67. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Then we will come back to Carson City. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in the neutral of Assembly Bill 67? Seeing none, is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in the neutral on Assembly Bill 67? 
seeing none. Secretary, I will invite you back to the table, and I do have one question. In the amendment for subsection 8 and section 8, subsection 2B, the amount of it states if the fund falls below 250000 is that the floor or is that the max that the fund can have? Because at um, the cap for 25000 a piece, that would kind of limit what the fund could do, and then how do we replenish that fund? What's, what's that mechanism? Uh, thank you, Chairman Ro Moreno. That that is correct. That that's creative floor of two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and then the intention is to replenish the fund as that balance falls below two hundred fifty thousand dollars, so that we do not run into a situation where victims apply for assistance and there is none available to them. And then, hopefully, my last question: Where would that additional funding come from? What's the source of that additional funding? I know that um, in the amendment you could accept donations. But would that be a general fund appropriation? Would it be coming to IFC to ask for money from the contingency account? Or would it just come from securities rollovers? Where would that extra funding come from? Uh, thank you for the question, Ch Chairman Moreno. The, the intention is for the money to, the revenue to be taken from securities division revenue, which totals anywhere from 30 to $35 million each year. Um, that's our hope and our goal, and also mainly um, from awards that we receive as penalties from um, people who sign consent orders or w against whom we are able to um, enter some sort of an order. So those individuals or entities pay penalties to the state through the Securities Division, and, and our hope and our goal is to utilize that money as the main funding source. All righty. Well, thank you. Just wanted to get that on the record. Yes, I think you're good to go. Thank you so much. And with that, we will close the so hearing much. on Assembly Bill 67. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And we'll go back to the top of our agenda and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 28. Welcome our treasurer to the table. Short is good. Um, Madam Chairwoman, I've been good at being short my whole life, so. Good evening, Chair Monroe Moreno and members of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I'm Zach Conine, and I have the pleasure of serving as your state treasurer. It's great to be here to present AB 28 in an incredibly abbreviated form. Um, AB 28 represents the largest proposed investment in helping combat generational poverty in our state's history. By establishing a baby bonds program similar to what is being done in other states like Connecticut, California, and Washington, we can start to change the way we think about investing in programs that are designed to promote economic mobility. Now, I'll skip that. There's a lot of great stuff in there. I just want you to know, but um, that's what this bill is. A baby bond is an investment in a child at the time of their birth, which continues to grow until their 18th birthday, at which time they can use that uh, investment to pay for things like a down payment on a house, starting a small business, or achieving higher education. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, I'm happy to walk through the fiscal impacts of the bill as currently written. Um, Section 8 of the bill establishes the Nevada Baby Bonds Program and houses it within our office. To be eligible to receive a baby bond, a child must be born in Nevada on or after January 1st, 2024, and their birth must be covered by Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, Section 9 requires the information to be passed to us by DHHS, uh, at which point we will invest $3,200 in the trust fund in the uh, child's name. Uh, roughly 44% of all births in Nevada are covered by Medicaid today, which would account for roughly 15 to 16,000 students on an annual basis. Um, we know that by definition some students will not claim those funds and so we'll have um, some opportunities to recoup uh, on that front. Uh, and in section 16 therefore you see the proposed appropriation of 80 million dollars from the general fund over the biennium to establish the cost uh, for the program for that population. Now we understand that is a big ask and it's a big number, um, but we think it's an ambitious program and uh, look forward to working its way through the process. Uh, and with that, um, Chair, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, 80 million is an aggressive ask. Yes, ma'am. We figured we'd keep the ask large and the treasurer short. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got me there. 
So if um, the committee decides to put in a lower amount um, appropriation, how will that affect the fiscal note that's on? Will you still need all of the positions that are listed in the fiscal note? Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, uh, mechanically, some of the positions involved in the fiscal note uh, would be smaller because we would have less interaction um, because there would be fewer people in the program. Um, as currently conceived, if we were not able to reach the entire population, we think the most fair and equitable way would be to run a lottery, which would not be very difficult, uh, within the population. So we take the entire population list, whatever the appropriation was, and then um, pick at random individuals within that program. Um, so we think we'd probably be able to cut back uh, a little bit on the, certainly on the fiscal note side that was the spending part, um, but a little bit on the other piece as well. So the fiscal note would be impacted. Would the amount for the beneficiaries also be impacted? Would there be some, uh, smaller awards if the initial appropriation was small? Treasurer Conan, for the record, uh, deeply open to feedback, and I think there's a lot of people in this space smarter than I am, um, but the intention was to have a, an amount of money large enough that the growth of that money over time would be uh, meaningful, right? That the, the baby bond upon the time of cashing when the, the individual was 18, it would be enough to help make a down payment for a home with the other programs, help make a meaningful contribution towards starting a small business or uh, attending higher education. And so I think I, we would be more likely to want to decrease the population and make sure that we were impactful amongst the population as opposed to increasing the population but decreasing the amount um, and potentially not having the, the generational change we were hoping for. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Members, any questions for the presenter? Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you, Treasurer. So um, I'm looking at the bill, and maybe, maybe I missed it, but um, I see for them to apply, they have to have been a resident in the state at least 12 months before applying and um, have reached at least 18, so the, funny, the money and the fund can grow. But how, can you just walk me through, how are you going to um, track children moving in and out of the state? Um, you know, just kind of the big picture, how this might work with the movement we have of people. Absolutely, and uh, thank you for the question, Treasurer Conan, for the record. So our intention here is not to create a program that is administratively uh, impossible to work. And as we've seen with other programs like this, both during the pandemic and before, the harder we make the program to access, the less likely it is for the individuals who need it the most to actually access it. And so originally, and when the child is born, uh, we would get the name from DHHS, and then they would move into an eligible population. Right now, then they go throughout their lives, and they may leave. They may be the uh, a child in a military family. Some families leave Nevada and then come back to Nevada. But the goal is we didn't want them to come back to Nevada the day before their 18th birthday, claim this money, and then go back to where they're going. So what we've set is a 12-month look back, um, which they would be able to prove in the same way that we prove residency for um, for uh, tuition, for voting, for anything else. Um, 12 months before their 18th birthday, right? And then the process of claiming, and I think this is important, involves a touch from our office to make sure that the funds are really going towards one of the purposes that, that we've tried to outline with this legislation, right? So if an individual is interested in using it um, to make a down payment on housing, we want to make sure that we're talking to them about some of the other down payment assistance programs that already exist, making sure that they're not getting into too much home and won't be able to afford it you know, down the road. If they're starting a small business, we want to make sure we're working um, with the rest of the state that they are starting a business that they're not being taken advantage of, right? That they're not joining some sort of multi-level marketing scheme or whatever is the, uh, is, is the scam in 18 years. Um, and if they're going to higher education, we want to make sure that they're doing all the other uh, work that can get them access to funds for higher education. We want to make sure they're filling out the FAFSA, and if they're eligible for Pell Grants and things like that, they're getting them. That if they are getting the Millennium Scholarship, that they've got a plan on how to layer those funds, right? And so a big piece of this is that financial education and touch when they are 18 um, to make sure that the dollars go to where we want them to go. I, I do see that, um, and I agree with you, that financial literacy training, that is part of the component that goes to there. But just to clarify, in my mind, but somebody could be born in the state and they could live elsewhere for 16 years and not be part of the state, but then come back just at least 12 months before they're 18 and then apply for the money. Is that it, correct? Treasure Conine, for the record, yes, in the same way that someone could uh, be born here, leave, and then come back and take in-state tuition, right? Um, our, our expectation is that uh, 
the number of people who would be willing to move from one state to another state and establish residency a year out for $10,000 is relatively de minimis. I'm sure it won't be zero, um, but we're trying to create the best program we can with a broad brush. Thank you, Treasurer. I have one other question. On the investment manager's position that was in your fiscal note, if the, the amount of the appropriation was lowered, would you still need that position? Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, uh, likely not, right? And so if the dollar amount went down, one of the things we would be able to do is use our existing investment manager contracts, perhaps the same contract that runs the permanent school fund, um, which would have similar investment requirements to this, to manage these dollars. And we would just do it as a pooled account, similar to what we do for the local government investment pool or any other um, set of dollars like that. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Assemblywoman Anderson will be reaching out to you after the meeting with a policy question, not a fiscal question. Um, and with that, I thank you for the presentation, and I'll ask you to take a step back, and we'll go to testimony and support. And I'm going to excuse myself for a moment, turn the meeting over to Majority Leader. Good afternoon, uh, members of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee. Ashley Cruz with Career Nevada, for the record, here on behalf of the Nevada Bankers Association. The Nevada Bankers Association is in support of AB 28. Michael Flores, on behalf of the University of Nevada, Reno, I want to thank the treasurer for bringing this forward. And hopefully a lot of those young people will be coming to the University of Nevada, Reno, um, because they'll stay in Nevada, hopefully. Um, and we are in full support. Thanks. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lilith Barron, L-I-L-I-T-H-B-A-R-A-N with the ACLU of Nevada. We are in full support of the Nevada Baby Bonds Program. One out of every seven children in Nevada lives in poverty. For Black and Native American children, it is one in four. We believe that this would do a great job closing wealth and um, racial disparities within our state. Thank you. Elise Monroe. Elise Monroy Marsala here on behalf of the Children's Advocacy Alliance. We are in strong support of this bill for all the reasons that my colleague, Ms. Barron, mentioned. Thank you. For the record, Annette Magnus, Executive Director of Battleborn Progress, we are in strong support of the Baby Bonds Bill. We think this is a creative investment to help our families get ahead, and this is exactly what our state should be spending money on, so thank you. Awesome. Is there anyone else here in Carson City in support? Okay, we will move to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Las Vegas in support? BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line in support? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you. We will now move to opposition. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to give opposition on Assembly Bill 45? Is there anyone in Las Vegas? Is there anyone on the phone line, BPS? And I apologize, it was Assembly Bill 28, not 45. Chair, there are no callers on the line. Okay, we will move to neutral. Is there anyone in Carson City in neutral? Anyone in Las Vegas? BPS, do we have any callers? Chair, there are no callers at this time. Treasurer, did you want to give any closing comments? Okay, I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 28. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 45. Treasurer, when you're ready. Good afternoon, Vice Chair. Thanks so much for having us today. I am Treasurer Zach Conine, and uh, just as an update, I still have the pleasure of serving as your state treasurer. Uh, great to be here today to present Assembly Bill 45. Uh, the bill before you today is a direct result of conversations we had during the Nevada Recovers Listening Tour, uh, where in each town and city and uh, small meeting room we went to, we heard over and over again about the dearth of medical professionals here in the state. Uh, and so this is our attempt to try and help here. Assembly Bill 45 seeks to address this problem by incentivizing healthcare professionals who live in Nevada or commit to relocating to the state with student loan repayment funds in exchange for committing to practice in a community that is greatly in need of their services. Um, the intention here is to use $5 million of money from the Unclaimed Property Trust Fund as 
reminder, our office administers the Unclaimed Property Trust Fund. Uh, dollars come in each year from businesses, go out to Nevadans, uh, but some of those dollars are never going to be able to go back. They come in without uh, identifying names or uh, they've been in the trust for so long uh, that we can't possibly find the person that they're attached to or they're so, so small that no one's going to go through the rigmarole to get back 17 cents. Those dollars uh, have been used historically for other uh, projects that are important. We use them to pay for the operations of that piece of our office. We use them to pay for $7.6 million of the Millennium Scholarship. We use them a uh, million dollars of that a year to pay for the grants matching that was created in AB 45, uh, 445 excuse me, during the last session. Um, so our intention here is to create a program in which medical professionals could receive up to $120,000 thousand dollars in uh, in student loan repayment after they've served four or five years with a portion of that being paid each year after they've done the work um, to make sure that we're getting what we are trying to pay for uh, and with that madam vice chair happy to take any questions thank you treasurer committee any questions assemblyman haven uh, thank you madam vice chair and uh, treasurer it's it's good to see you this evening um, so um, I know I'd mentioned uh, Previously, uh, that we have AB 248 out there that um, historically has been used for student uh, loan repayment through the Nevada Health Service Corps. Um, could you could you kind of explain how these two might interact? Treasurer Conan, for the record, so that program has always been funded with one-shot appropriations uh, each and every time. And of course, whenever you're looking at a loan repayment program, funding it with one-shots is difficult because you create um, some instability from year to year. So we would certainly be happy if it was the desire of, of this committee and this legislature to include uh, funding for that program as part of this, either by increasing the appropriation um, to $5,250,000 a year or simply by taking the first $250,000 out of it. That program works and it's been effective for a long time and we don't see a need to you know not fund that in exchange for funding this if that is um, the decision of this legislature C committee assemblywoman kasama thank you treasurer um you and i visited about this bill i love the bill i think it's great i think it's what we need for our state to encourage people to come here i carried a bill last session and this session as well to promote you know the reduction in uh, tuitions and i think it's an important way and we need to compete with the other states and and bring our healthcare professionals back here and uh, home grow them and help them so thank you members any other questions okay thank you treasurer we're going to move to testimony we will take testimony in support starting in carson if there's anyone in vegas in support please head to the table Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Tom Clark. I am here on behalf of the Board of Medical Examiners this evening. Uh, the Board of Medical Examiners very much supports this bill. In fact, they were inspired by it in a way that uh, when they were putting together their administrative changes bill, which is AB 318 that passed out this morning, they increased the fines that they can administer against physicians. Those fines hadn't been increased since 1985. So they went from 5,000 to $10,000. More so, inspired by AB 45, those fines, instead of going to the general fund, will now be targeted to these kinds of programs. So we very much support this and uh, hope that it moves through. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Watkins. I represent the Nevada State Medical Association. As a patient and physician advocacy organization, we are in support of AB, 40, AB 45. The passage of this bill will improve our state's ability to keep healthcare education graduates in Nevada and address access barriers faced every day by thousands of Nevadans and medically underserved and economically disadvantaged areas across the state. We thank you for um, hearing this bill. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Cody Hoskins. I'm the political director for SEIU Local 1107, and we are here in support of AB 45. Uh, SEIU represents over 8,000 nurses and healthcare workers throughout the state of Nevada. Um, AB 45 will help improve and increase our nurse pipeline by creating a program to incentivize more Nevadans to become healthcare workers. SEIU urges your support. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Blaine Osborne, Nevada Rural Hospital Partners, for the record, uh, here in strong support of AB 45. First, really want to thank Treasurer Conine for this historic investment in loan repayment, and also thank uh, Eric Jimenez for all of his work on this. Uh, they worked uh, very, very diligently with us over on the other house to get some of the definitions correct and really appreciate their prioritization of the rural counties uh, through this program. Um, to Assemblyman Hafen's question earlier, we have historically always supported and worked very closely with the Nevada Health Service Corps loan repayment program. We really appreciate that program and, and think that we have a fantastic opportunity here to try to combine those programs. We think they're very complementary. And um, the good thing with the Nevada Health Service Corps program is that it brings those federal matching dollars, which we desperately need. Thank you very much. Hello again, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee, Ashley Cruz with Career Nevada for the record here on behalf of Toro University. Toro University graduates 180 future doctors every year. And although that they don't always get to stay because of lack of residency programs, this will entice them to come back to Nevada and help our provider shortage. And so we are in full support. Good evening, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Alejandro Rodriguez with Nevada System of Higher Education, and she is in strong support of AB 45, and we'd like to thank the Treasurer for bringing this measure forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Chair, members of Assembly Ways and Means. The v Dylan Keith with the Vegas Chamber. We are in strong support of this program. Uh, Health care sh shortage in Nevada is incredibly severe, and this, economic, or this workforce development program is absolutely essential here, and we ask for your support. Thank you. Elise Monroy Marsala here on behalf of the Nevada Psychiatric Association, um, and we are in strong support of this measure, and we urge your support. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I am the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We're here tonight in strong support of this measure. We believe that student, or we know that student loan debt is a huge issue for many of our students. We also know that uh, we need more healthcare professionals in our state, and we think this is a great investment to do both of those things and help with both of those issues. Thank you. Good evening, committee. For the record, my name is Joelle Gutman Dodson with the Washoe County Health District, and I'll just be quick and say ditto. Uh, and also, this is a shameless plug for AB 69, which is a similar bill that does some similar items that we'd love to get heard and, and some funding appropriated. Thank you. Michael Flores on behalf of the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, would like to thank the Treasurer as well for bringing this forward. And uh, I know Assemblyman Hafen brought this uh, bill up, AB 248, which the Nevada Health Service Corps is uh, housed out of the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine, serves the entire state, uh, and has been really effective in um, matching those federal dollars that come to the state. And hopefully, uh, this committee will be open to uh, including that in, in AB 45. Thank you. Paige Barnes for the Nevada Nurses Association. We're here in support of AB 45. Thank you. Kent Irvin, Nevada Faculty Alliance, in full support. Thank you, Bradley Mayor, representing Southern Nevada Health District. Uh, ditto, we're in full support. Anything that can help our workforce pipeline uh, is needed in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in Carson City? Seeing no one in Las Vegas, BPS, can we check the phone line? If you would like to testify in support of AB 45, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no colleagues choosing to testify at this time. Thank you, BPS. So we are now gonna go to opposition. Is there anyone in Carson City in opposition? Anyone in Las Vegas, please approach the table. Okay, seeing no one, BPS, can we please check the phone line? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 45, take your place in the queue. Good evening, members of the committee. This is Steve Messenger with Nevada Primary Care Association representing the state's federally qualified health centers. I apologize. I did not somehow get in in time for support, but we are strongly in support. Uh, workforce retention and recruitment is the biggest issues that we hear from our members every day, and I think this is a brilliant solution. Thanks to the treasurer and his office. Thank you all. 
Thank you for your call. We will move your testimony into support. Um, BPS, is there anyone on the line for opposition? Chair, there are no additional callers. She's going to testify at this time. Okay, thank you. I am now going to hand the gavel back over to our chair. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in Carson City or in Las Vegas wishing to testify in the neutral position? Okay, seeing none, BPS, can we check the telephone line? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB45, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Any closing comments, Treasurer Conine? Okay, I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 45. A committee, we will go into a one-minute recess. All right, thank you, Majority Leader, for assisting me. And we will continue with our agenda and open the hearing for Assembly Bill 46, which makes various changes relating to historical markers. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair and Committee, Assembly Committee on Ways and Means. James Settlemeyer, for the record, Director of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. The subject of this bill is the basically the blue stanchion markers across the state of Nevada, you know, shaped like the state of Nevada with historical marker information on them. We also have some stone ones and also plaques. That being said, we've had a problem over the years trying to find someone to go out and investigate those, make sure that they haven't had graffiti or any problems or have had fading. And in that respect, the original intent of the previous administration was to transfer that over to the DOT, which the DOT said, well, there's a fiscal note. That being said, it was my opinion that we could probably do this in-house better within DCNR by transferring it to state parks. Or in that respect, that has been done so, and by doing so, it has removed all fiscal notes on this bill. I stand for questions if you wish, Madam Chair. Thank you. So will there be a change in the look at all, or they stay the same? The, the plan is, uh, James Sotomayor, again, for the record, Director of Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. The intent is to keep them the same as they are updated over time as necessary. Language will be changed to bring it up to current terminologies okay. uh, over time. Some of them are a little bit old and have old wording. We'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Members, any questions for the presenter? Seeing none, I like no fiscal notes. Thank you so much. Then we will move to testimony and support. Is there anyone here that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 46? Seeing none, is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 46? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone lines? If you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 46, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. Coming back to Carson City, we will move to opposition. Is there anyone that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 46? Seeing none. I'm not seeing anyone in Las Vegas, so we'll go back to the phone lines. BPS, do we have anyone that would like to testify in opposition or neutral of Assembly Bill 46? If you would like to testify in opposition or neutral for Assembly Bill 46, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Then we will move into the neutral position. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in the neutral on Assembly Bill 46? Seeing none, still not seeing anyone in Las Vegas. So I guess this is almost the quickest hearing that we've had. Um, did you have any closing comments? All right, so with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 46. Thank you so much.
Members, we will have a one minute recess. We're just waiting for the next presenter to get upstairs. He's presenting downstairs. Good evening, members. We'll come back to order and we will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 77. And Speaker Yeager, you can begin whenever you are ready. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Steve Yeager. I represent Assembly District 9 in Southwest Las Vegas, and it is an honor to present to you tonight Assembly Bill 77 in its first reprint. I'm going to be pretty quick about what the bill does, and, and I will tell you ahead of time. Um, I had some folks who were willing to come and give a lot of testimony, and I said given where we are in session, uh, probably not necessary, um, but I wanted to let you know this uh, bill was pretty well supported in the policy committee. So it creates an office of entrepreneurship inside of GOED, the Governor's Office of Economic Development. And the impetus behind this bill is that we don't really have anything in the state that supports that sort of entrepreneur um, uh, effort in the state. Um, you know, there was some talk then, and you know, uh, we made a decision as a committee to continue to fund the Office of Small Business Advocacy. I see this, this office as being additive, not duplicative, because that office really deals with small businesses. This deals with new businesses, businesses that are less than five years old. So the bill does um, a number of things, but I, I think probably uh, one of the most important is it's going to be able to look at how are we doing in the state in terms of new businesses. Um, there's a bunch of metrics where um, this office is going to sort of analyze that and be able to come back to the legislature. So I think we have a, a better sense of how we're doing in attracting, um, not attracting, and, and, and helping folks start their business here in the state of Nevada. And then um, we're also going to get uh, an indication of how much in terms of our state contracts, how much is actually going to new businesses versus um, older established businesses. And I think that can help us as a legislature decide on future policies because we should really want to have this startup um, culture here in the state of Nevada. So that's the um, policy part of the bill. Uh, of course, we are here because there is a fiscal impact. And the fiscal note, um, as you have a chance to see, is from the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Because we're asking them to do something, and they need people to do that something. And so I've been in discussions uh, with them, and there are representatives here that we, we can talk about that. Um, we have not been able to completely eliminate the fiscal note, because I do think that this office is going to require staffing. But we have been able to uh, work our way down to two employees rather than three. Um, so I think they can speak to that as well. But my understanding is that that roughly um, reduces the fiscal note by about $180,000 over the biennium. Um, and this is rough math, of course. I know this committee needs better than rough math, but that would put us down to about, I believe, 455000 for the biennium to be able to fund the two positions uh, that are needed in this office to carry out the duties as prescribed in Assembly Bill 77 in its first reprint. So, Madam Chair, uh, given it's been a long day for everyone, I'll, I will leave it there, but certainly happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much for the presentation. And you had said that it would go from the three um, FTEs to two. Um, could you, could you or someone from GoEd explain what those two positions would be? And we would need um, 
an updated fiscal note. You can get back to us. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, so um, the to just to kind of update the numbers a little bit, the original. Can I just? Oh, get sorry, you to James Hum, Governor's Office of Economic Development, for the record. Uh, just to kind of update those figures, initially we had it at um, 711,000, uh, and the speaker was almost exactly on. It's a reduction of $179,362, uh, bringing the grand total to $531,738 or $531,738 um, for for the total over the biennium. Um, we would be removing, uh, and again, thank you to the speaker and his chief, chief of staff for working with us on this to tighten it up. Uh, we would be removing the AA4 position. Uh, so total salary and fringe benefits would be less $164,230 uh, and then less additional uh, um, operating equipment and office space expenses of $15,132. Uh, we would leave in the request an ASO2 and an MA3 um, and if necessary we can get into a little more detail. I would if, if necessary, I'd like to bring Carson Heisey to the table, who would actually be running the program, but our thought behind that was to have a higher paid positions due to the in intricacies of this type of work and the necessity of the individual we would like to fulfill to fill these positions. Thank you so much for that. And um, how soon can you get us that updated fiscal note so we'll have it for the files? Uh, James Hum, go ahead for the record. I have the rough math right here, and uh, in my prepared mar remarks, I would say we will get that to you before work session, and I know you're going to try to do that this week, so I'll have the fiscal team work on it first thing in the morning to, to actually put uh, <laughs> a more legible one in front of the committee. Perfect. Thank you. Members, any questions for either one of the presenters? Assembly Wama Kasama. I'm on a roll tonight. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I know you had said it's not dupli du duplicating the, the um, Office of Small Business, but we have the Office of Small Business and Business and Industry, and now we've created the Office of Small Business under the governor's uh, branch. And I do understand the importance of fostering this, but was there any consideration to not creating a whole new office and all new regulation and just having you know, a department within the Office of Small Business that would focus on this instead of a whole new office. It just seems that um, might have been a possibility. Um, Steve Yeager, for the record, uh, through you, Madam Chair, great question. Um, I, I think we really did be, we really were, were deliberate about the best way to do this. And I think the options were create some totally brand new office by itself or try to house it in an existing location. Um, a couple of reasons led us to go, Ed. Uh, number one, I think they're just very well situated in this space when we're talking about sort of startups and new businesses. And at the time, remember, we weren't sure that the Office of Small Business Advocacy was going to continue to exist because in the governor's recommended budget, it was actually recommended to be discontinued because there was a sunset there. Uh, but this, there was a lot of discussion in, in the Judiciary Committee about that, whether this really was duplicative and housed in the right place. And I think the way we envision it was, you know, the small business office really is for that, that small business. And this would be uh, just a different mission, but there would be a nice, you know, they, they'd, they'd have a way to work together. So, you know, when I think of entrepreneurship, I really do think of economic development, right? And we are getting more and more companies that want to start here versus some of our neighboring states, um, the big one being California, obviously, and I think the tax structure has a lot to do with that. So um, I guess I'll just say I think we were deliberate that this probably was the best place for it. Um, and I was comfortable as a part of this committee continuing to authorize the Office of Small Business Advocacy because I think they play a little bit of a different role. Now, certainly as we go forward and we're here, those of us who are going to be here next session, uh, we never know if that's going to happen, but I think we'll have a chance to really decide, you know, if they, we need to make some changes. But just the mission of the office, I believe, aligns a little bit more with the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Thank you. Can we follow up? Members, any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. And with that, I'll ask you to step back, take a seat, and we will call those that are here in Carson City that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 77. You can fill in all the chairs. Don't forget to turn on your mic, state, and spell your name for the record. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair, or evening, I guess, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Sheila Bray with the University of Nevada, Reno. We'd like to show our support for this bill. Um, as many of you may know, we house a small business development center at the University of Nevada, Reno that also serves the entire state, as well as we do other business development and entrepreneurship activities. And so we believe this will just help those businesses as well as our students that pursue entrepreneurship um, a pathway. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Ashley Cruz with Career Nevada for the Record here on behalf of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. The OVGEA appreciates the, spe the speaker for bringing this bill forward and supports measures that seek to assist small businesses in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Go Good ahead. afternoon, Chair and members of Ways and Means. Dylan Keith with the Vegas Chamber. We absolutely support this bill. We thank the speaker for bringing it forward. We believe that this is not only increasing economic development, but giving another tool for folks who are just trying to pursue their dream and open up their own business and maybe even hire some more employees and create more jobs in Nevada. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good, Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Committee for the Record. Mindy Elliott representing Career in Nevada and the uh, Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada. We are in uh, full support of this. If we start looking at businesses and the life of a business, and they have to start somewhere, and we have a lot of tools in the toolbox at the state, and I think that the Small Business Advocacy Office it serves its, its purpose of, of navigating the state and how do you get your license and how do you do this. But this, pro this office will really focus on how do you get a loan, how do you, what do you need to do, and more importantly, they will provide access to those RDAs out in the state and will provide actual this is what you need to do, and more importantly, this is who's coming to the state. So if I have an idea or, or a vision to be in business, that I, I know how to package my business so that I can actually make some money. So we are in full support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing no one else here in Carson City for testimony and support. We'll move to Las Vegas. I do not see anyone in our room in Las Vegas. BPS, do we have anyone joining us on the phone line that would like to testify in support? Opposition or neutral on Assembly Bill 77. If you would like to testify in support, opposition, or neutral of Assembly Bill 77, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. So we'll come back to Carson City. Is there anyone here in the audience in Carson City that would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 77? Seeing none and still not seeing anyone in Las Vegas, we will move to the neutral. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in the neutral position of Assembly Bill 77? Seeing none and no one in Las Vegas and no one on our phone line, I'll ask our presenter, do you have any closing remarks? All right, so with that, we will close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 77. And move to the very last item on our agenda for tonight, and that is public comment. Do we have anyone here in Carson City that would like to provide public comment? If so, I invite you up to the chairs at the table. Please remember to push the mic button, state and spell your name for the record. And we will get started here in Carson City. Good evening. Hi. My can you hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Katrin Ivanov, AKA Mrs. Fixit. Uh, uh, Ivanov, I-V-A-N-O-F-F, -F, Assembly District 42, Senate District 9. Um, I recently got into politics and learning how you guys make the laws, and I'm very surprised to see that many views on the Nellies, because that's where I'm getting my information from, are heavily supported by people, but you guys don't give them the chance to be heard and the people to be able to express opinions uh, and actually be voted on. And also, the opposite is true. Many bills are heavily opposed by people, but they still are going through and you guys are voting them on. And when I say you, I don't mean you exactly. I mean legislature as general. Uh, and it's very mind-boggling to me why is this happening and because I believe we voted you in to come here and to represent us and even if you have different of opinions I believe you should be following what we want you guys to put forward and what we don't want you to it, it, I, I have a question if you're not listening to to your represent uh, to your constituents who are you actually listening to? 
uh, who are you actually working for? In the opposite is true too. There's some good bills that you guys are doing, but the majority of bills that are coming in these sessions are honestly mind-boggling to me. And I also also have a question: um, Do you guys read the Constitution prior to st writing bills? Because many of the bills are quite frankly unconstitutional, and uh, I know that they have to go to some kind of a. a department that is legal department and I'm surprised they even passed legal department. Um, I want to urge you to please listen to uh, the governor's bill 405, I believe it's SB 405. Uh, it is very sound bill but and it's very heavily supported on both sides of the aisle. 70% uh, of people want uh, ID when you're going to vote, we all have IDs. We can't do anything without ID. You can't even go to uh, Walgreens without ID. Maybe now you can, because now you can just go and grab things without paying from Walgreens, apparently. But uh, for most things that you have to do, and if you are a law-abiding citizen, you need an ID. And uh, also, this bill also provides for IDs for people that cannot afford them. So that should be helpful. Uh, please, please. I know you only have until Friday to hear that bill. Please figure out a way to put it into the agenda. I know you can do that with very short notice, which is also something that I don't like. People should have more than 24 hour notice on whatever you're gonna listen so they can uh, put it in their schedule to be able to participate. If you put something at night and it's on the agenda in the morning, a lot of people may miss it because we also got to go to work. And we may be working at the point that the bill is put on, then go home, eat, go to bed, we wake up, and the hearing is over. So there should be some kind of time. There is all those bill of rights and that are worrying about other people from other states. I think we should have bill of rights for Nevadans. You have utilized your two minutes. I thank you so much for joining us here tonight. If you have anything else, you can submit it to us in writing. Thank you so much. And thank much. you for joining us in the Assembly Ways and Means Committee tonight. Thank you. Members, that brings us to the, <laughs> that brings us to the end of our agenda. I don't see anyone in Las Vegas to join us um, for public comment. And BPS, do we have anyone on the phone lines that would like to submit public comment tonight? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take a quick view. Chair, there are no callers choosing to provide public comment at this time. Thank you so much. Members, we've had a full day. We'll be back at this bright and early tomorrow morning, but tonight this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>